give me a big Santa Monica welcome for Dennis, the CEO of Udemy. It's good to be here. All right, so we're going to do some quick facts about the business, which I like to do. Uh, year founded? 2010. Okay. And for those of you that don't know already, this is going to be um, quite impressive. Money raised? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> uh, over 150 million. Number, number of employees? 250. What public stats do you share about the uh, number of courses, number of courses watched? What stuff's public that we can talk about here? Quick snapshots. Sure. Uh, I mentioned some of them earlier. So over 13, yep. mi 13 million students. We're adding hundreds of thousands of students every month. Um, we've got over 40,000 courses. We add you know, 1,500 or 2,000 courses every month. Uh, again, the courses, uh, they're, they're taught in 80 different languages. About wow. half of our instructors are outside the U.S. Two-thirds of our students are outside the U.S. Uh, about half of our revenue originates from outside the U.S. So and, it is and the truly platform is one where people upload their own courses. So it's a distribution platform for people that want to teach a skill and then you share in the revenue. That's right. right. That's right. Um, fact you may not know, I think I'm actually on your cap table. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Well, I knew so, you were an instructor early on. So. Yeah, I, well, I was, besides that, I was the mentor for your co-founders and Gagan in the Founders Institute. Okay, Fant fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a point zero 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 one <laughs> in there somewhere for me, um, which we'll just use to pass on. Well, hopefully that'll still be meaningful, by the way. Yes, <laughs> at 173 million raised. All right, so let's talk a little bit about your journey. Uh, you weren't one of the founders of the business, but that's you've right. come on a CEO, and you've really scaled it to the heights it's at now. I think one of the things that's going to be a really fascinating topic tonight is what's it like to run a business, especially one as successful as you to me, as a non-founder. Sure. Right? There's lots of issues there. And of the three founders, how many are still there right now? Are there any? None of them are there. They're all doing their own business. The, the primary founder is still the chairman of the board. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is semi-retired. I should say the second one is semi-retired, and the third one is the CEO of another company. Cool. All right, so let's talk about your journey, and we're going to come back to you to me in a bit. Where'd you grow up? I grew up outside Philadelphia, suburbs of Philadelphia. Cool. Where'd you go to undergrad? Uh, Northwestern. I was a chemical engineer there, okay. which was super painful, by the way, <laughs> just to be sure. I did not leave the lab very much. What did you do right after undergrad? So... Uh, I think this was between my junior and senior year, I was able to get an internship in that field in chemical engineering. And they had me designing the safety valves on these reactors. And I was thinking to myself, I have no idea what I'm doing. I think someone could die if, if I continue this. <laughs> um, and it was, look, it was academically it was super interesting to, to study the topic, but um, I didn't really have a passion for it. And once I started working in it, I realized, okay, well, this isn't necessarily something I want to do for the mm -hmm. rest of my life. So um, when I graduated, I ended up looking for jobs more in business, in general, mm -hmm. broadly speaking. And uh, I was able to convince uh, a consulting firm, PwC, to, to hire me as a, a consultant focused mostly on their uh, financial valuation practice. And then you went into the product side of things, right? With startups and tech companies? That's right. So I did um, consulting. I did a little venture capital for a little bit. And then I, uh, after venture capital, I actually worked at one of our portfolio companies and then went back to business school. So after business school, you, you know, you, you've worked for a little bit, you kind of realize, like, well, wait a minute, actually, I have no idea what I'm doing because I've never Stanford worked business in a school? company. Yes, at Stanford. So I actually, after You're wearing business the best. School, I feel like everyone who goes to Stanford Business School thank you. Is that has to wear a button-down shirt with <laughs> That's the a vest. Yeah. <laughs> so I fit the part. Yeah. So anyway, so I graduated and I, I worked in uh, product in uh, various uh, operating capacity or various technology companies, just try to get a better sense of how, how, how many years run. did you work in product for? Seven. Do you have a, do you have a product for a lot? So let's, let's give me give you a sense of everybody here. How many of you here are working on your own startup? All right. Great. And how many of you work in tech? And how many of you are, have recently or are in the process of soon trying to raise money for your company? All right. So there are a lot of folks here that are actively building product, whether that's their own company or company they're working for. Um, talk a little bit about your product philosophy, right? It, it, to, to come up through the product ranks and then become a CEO of one of the most wildly successful venture-backed company these days. How would you encapsulate your product philosophy for those folks that are working on their products today? What key pieces of advice would you have for them? Sure. 
Um, so I'm going to take it down to two threads. The first one is uh, how you define product. There's a lot in a lot of places. People don't really understand what product management means or product marketing means, and it really depends. And actually, if you work at different companies, you'll see wildly different philosophies on what particular role product plays. Uh, and so, and I'll, I'll give a couple of different extremes. In one extreme, product is sort of a, takes a backseat, and if it's an engineering-driven culture, product is almost like, you know, to, to put it. Uh, sort of a, I guess more of a negative light, it's almost like they're dock riders because engineers are saying, we're mm -hmm. going to do this, we're going to do this, and they're driving the bus. What's an example of a company that's more engineering driven than Oracle. you Oracle. Oracle. Okay. And then you, have, uh, then you have certain companies where product is um, much more in the driver's seat. So they're dictating what actually happens and they have much more of a broad ownership of the overall business. Uh, and generally speaking, I like to have, I like to see those models because what happens is product in those particular cases ends up being uh, that connective tissue for the rest of the organization. It, it gets to see more system level information than any group outside of the CEO. And they get to bring together all the different pieces and launch things mm -hmm. in much more of a cohesive manner. So usually I like to see that set up more, but you know, it's, it's much more, you, you need a certain type of person to be in those particular roles. And What are the big mistakes people make in product? Uh, so, just related to that and yeah. kind of building on this, a lot of times what you find is there are a lot of product people, or there are a lot of people who work in product that are not product people. Mm. They're actually just business people. And so, you know, they're the... What is a product person in your definition then? In my mind, in the, the most important facet of having or being or characteristic of somebody who's working in product is somebody who loves to understand the customer. And I hate to use the term, but it's really around customer centricity, having that sense of what's really going on in the minds of a customer and putting your, yourself in those shoes. But oftentimes, you will find a lot of PMs who are not that. They're more just business people, mm -hmm. and there's, they're more in like PowerPoint and things like that, and mm -hmm. they think about the market. They're going top down as opposed to bottoms up and really trying to understand what's happening on the ground and get into the consumer psychology. And this, is, this, this holds true both for consumer product versus enterprise product, and I generally speaking, I find that the people that work in consumer product and are successful have to be a cut above on versus the enterprise side. Okay. By the way, I think there's gonna be a lot of tweetable things you say tonight, so let's let's throw out your at tweet handle. What is it? <laughs> uh, Dennis Yang. D E N N I S Y A N G. A T T in the middle and Y A. Oh, Dennis T Yang. Yeah. All right. At Dennis T Yang, at you to me, the cool stuff you hear tonight. Let's make sure we'll get you lots of tweets. Okay. All right. So you're coming up through product. Um, and then where were you most recently at right before you to me? So I was in the ad tech business. And how many people work in ad tech? Okay. So that, that's actually great because it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> I always consider, like, having worked in it for a long time, it took me a little while to realize it. it was, it's like a ferociously competitive market that's kind of small and mm -hmm. where you have Google and Facebook basically, like, eating the entire thing. Mm -hmm. So I, when I finally left, I was thinking to myself, like, oh, wow, that was, I wonder why I did that for so long. How long were you at that company before you joined Udemy? A little over four years. So talk about the process, because Udemy was the first time you were a CEO, is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. What was the process like? Uh, a lot of times it's probably boards that are reaching out to folks that they know. Right. How did it come about that they brought you in as the CEO, and where was the company at during that stage? Sure. Um, so from a history standpoint, uh, I joined the company, we had about 12 people. All right, so still really early, and you know, I'm not a founder. I, I, How much did the company raise at that point? Uh, we had done a million dollar angel round and a $3 million Series A. So I actually think this would be really helpful because a lot of folks here at the beginning of their journey, um, and I, I remember the very humble beginnings of Udemy. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult business to start. It's a two-sided marketplace, right, for those of you that aren't as familiar with it, you have to get the content creators to upload their content to the platform, and then you have to drive the audience there. And in the beginning, you're making a very, very small percentage. The vast majority of courses were free. I think I had one, I was in the top 10 free courses for a long time, and then you just took out all the free stuff, which is very smart, very tricky. And uh, I think I had something like 4,000 reviews. You did earn some. Oh, uh, did I? I went back and looked. Oh, yeah, good to almost 100,000 students. Good to know. Uh, but I think what's really fascinating is, let's just talk for a second about the timeline of, of how much money the company raised and in what intervals. Sure. Because I don't think people realize it wasn't like 
Udemy was started by a group of people that had had this major success and they raised $50 million right off the bat. Yeah. It was very humble beginnings to start. Yeah, actually, uh, to put a finer point on it, it was extraordinarily painful in the beginning. <laughs> like, really painful. Um, what was most painful about it in the beginning? Well, I, I should also painful? say that mention that the market and the environment has changed yes. dramatically since that time period. But yeah. I mean, you have to think about it. We had the company had three founders, all super young, very inexperienced. Two of them were, um, uh, you know, very much engineering, uh, design, and product focus. They had just moved from Turkey, uh, and you, you took this trio out to Silicon Valley, and they barely, you know. Out mm -hmm. in the market, and they're trying to raise money. It was extremely painful. By the way, that's not necessarily a bad thing because what that in that process, in that mm -hmm. early process of uh, only being able to raise what we were able to raise through, literally, I think in the angel round, there were over 50 pitches, and in the A wow. round, I mean, a three million dollar Series A for a consumer company that's a marketplace where when we talk about this a little bit later. There is a long gestation period for it, for it to make. Uh, for, for anything to actually happen, mm -hmm. there's just a sort of a, a time lag. You basically have like one shot at the title. Like if you don't make <laughs> contact with the ball immediately, you're dead. Yeah. And you compare that today, where you know, like the round series A is round series, like they're much larger. And, I, and frankly, like the angel rounds are in, yeah. in a lot of in a lot of cases a lot larger larger than that. In any case, the the reason this is important is because it 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 creates that founding culture of scrappiness. Mm -hmm. Right of scarcity, and that is really, really important. So uh, it's it's a lot harder to manage if you raise a lot of money if you don't have that core and that center of um, uh, of scrappiness that came from the the very beginning. Yeah. So all right, so the company it's 2010 and it raises its first seed round of a million. That's right. All right, and then how long did that last until you raised the three million? 2011 was raised uh, the three million. I joined in 2012, and in the fall of 2012, we raised a Series B of 12 million. Where were your metrics? I think this is something that's really helpful for folks to understand. Where were your metrics at that it was, you were able to raise that B round? What did you achieve by that point? So to be sure, we were a tweener, meaning we were technically not a B. When people yeah. think about like what an actual B Series B company looks like and where we were, we were not that. Like we were much more on the A side, but you know we had like a million bucks left. We had to, mm -hmm. and raise you had to make it happen. We had to go make it happen. Um, and were you active? Were you personally active in that fundraising round? Yeah, no, I, I led all the rounds since since I joined the company. So, um, so when you came on, you came on right away as CEO. I actually didn't. I came on as as president. So the okay. way that it worked was um, uh, one of the co-founders was CEO, mm -hmm. and he wanted he basically wanted to focus exclusively on product design and engineering, and mm -hmm. he was amazing at it. And having worked in product for as long as I did, I don't know that I was particularly good at it, quite honestly, but you know when people have that touch, and he absolutely well, had so that So let's touch. talk about that. So what sure. was the name of the founder? Aaron Bali. Aaron. What, what, what did Aaron have? What was his product magic? What were some of the calls that he made? What were some of the things he did? What are some lessons that, what are some skills that he had that we could pass on to this group of what made him special at product? I don't know that there are like specific examples that um, you know you, you can bring to light, but oftentimes I find that it doesn't take a long conversation with somebody who's in product to understand how they think and if they're thinking deeply enough about it uh, to to know whether or not they're going to be really good at it. But it's hard to actually say, you know, uh, these are some core things that you would think about. I mean, maybe we can come back to it, but. Uh, okay. I, I, Probably one well, maybe what was the biggest thing you learned from him? Uh, the thing I learned from him was well, actually, so this is this is actually pretty easy. So the found, I should just share the founding story, okay? And the, the the reason he was so good at it was he had a deep personal passion that specifically related to a problem he was trying to solve. And so the founding story is he grew up in eastern rural Turkey, in a small village, classic one room schoolhouse. Literally, like one room schoolhouse. Um, he's grown up, his older sister is getting ready to go to college, and his parents uh, bought her a computer. Uh, she didn't have a particular interest in it, but mm -hmm. he ended up taking a liking to it, and he started to teach himself math over the internet. So it turns out that he's good at math. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean gold medalists, math Olympians in Turkey. 
Oh wow! Silver medalist, <laughs> international math Olympiads, wow. and like you know, graduating from high school earlier, Got going it. to a university where nobody in his region ever went to, completely changed his life. So he obviously understood the power from his own experience of what could happen. So he was always thinking about what does it mean to actually learn online, and wow. then but also flip it around. What does it mean to teach online? So he wow. was thinking so deeply about these problems in a way that other people weren't. And by the way, in 2010, you go out and you try to raise money and say, "Yeah, we're going to do something in video, and it's going to be like an education." <laughs> what? And who are you? Yeah. Like, what are we doing here? Um, yeah. So it was it was difficult. Wow. All right. So. Um, the story's unfolding, there's the three co-founders. Um, what were the keys to you? Because you said you had a million dollars left in the bank. We were kind of tweener, our, our statistics didn't totally justify it. I'm sure a lot of people here have felt, had a raise, have felt that before. What, what do you think was the key thing to helping you get that, that larger round done in 2011, right? 2012? Sure. Uh, that was 2012. Um, we did hit an inflection point in growth, right, sort of during the, the midst of that funding cycle, and it was through, you know, quite honestly, a little bit of luck, but it just sheer force of will. I'm not gonna, I, like, I'm not gonna make that up. Like, the team worked in a way where, uh, you know, let's face it, you, you do your most creative work when your back is against the wall. It's not when, like, things are totally just like, hey, look, no hands, like we're, yeah. we're, we're crushing it. No, 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 that's that's not actually when you do your best work. Yeah. And um, one of the things that was so interesting for us is in in uh, soon after you launched, we had actually started doing video. We weren't obviously a marketplace, um, but we thought about doing courses, and we were watching some of the things you were doing, and we found some learnings. Right, that you start off with these general courses, but the only things that people wanted to pay for were things that had hard technical skills around them. Yeah. So it had to be Excel, it had to be learn to code, it had to be something that you could immediately tie to, to your professional mm -hmm. career. And I remember the day I saw you guys go all in on Excel, it became on your homepage, and then you started the model where you would actually buy traffic for your content contributors and you would take a larger spread mm -hmm. of the course. And it seemed like that was a big way that things started to scale, because at first, it was that content creators kept like 80% and the company kept 20 yeah. or 70, 30. And then like a lot of companies, when they do the promotion for the content creator, you take the much larger part. Um, how big a part was that to that, to that growth early on? Uh, I don't know that necessarily. So the, the take rate and the economics between how we share economics between ourselves and instructors, I mean, that plays a role in it. Um, but honestly, that's not a key driving factor in sort of the, the, the growth of the business. Um, the biggest thing is in any other two-sided market, as we've talked about, is there is this gestation period. Yeah. Like the chicken and the egg, and as you mentioned earlier, in the very early days, we'd go out there and we'd call some instructors and say, hey, look, would you like to teach on Udemy? And they'd yeah, say, how did you convince people early on to put their content on Udemy? How did you get to the first 10,000 courses? Um, not easily. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a classic chicken and egg, and yeah. we, we do it as you bake the chicken. You fake the chicken. Fake the chicken. <laughs> so uh, in this particular case, we, we are a, we're a demand-constrained marketplace, but it always starts with supply. Certain yeah. marketplaces are absolutely su supply-constrained, and their business yeah. flies once you get the supply. That's not necessarily the case with us. But we did have to go out, go out and get the supply. But you had it in the early days, it's OK to yeah. do all the unscalable things. A lot, of people, a lot of times people get caught up in like, hey, no, just do things that are scalable. In the early days, you can't do that. So what we would do is we would literally like since no one would actually create a course, we, you know, as, as in one, one particular example, we'd, uh, we would host the conference and then we, we would film it and then we would oh, make a course and we would do all the production so they didn't have to do anything. They just had oh, to come wow. to the conference. But you had to take one course at a time and make it as successful as possible. You couldn't go out and get yeah. a whole bunch of courses and then you would fail and then you wouldn't get that flywheel going. So it had to be get a couple courses make them really successful, and then back and forth and back and forth. They, the supply and demand always have to work in lockstep, at which point, at some point, you know, the bit will flip, and then you get the flywheel going, and then all of a sudden it becomes, well, if you're an instructor, a prospective instructor, and you want to share your knowledge to students all over the world, where are you going to go? Gonna go? Well, of course yeah. I'm going to go to Udemy. So early, like 2012, or maybe even now, I think it'd be interesting, what are like top 10 most popular courses? Sure. What are the, what are the things yeah. that just absolutely kill it on Udemy? And I, and I think you publicly share this, but I mean, 
some of your content creators make like north of a million dollars a year on Udemy, right? Yeah. So that's pretty amazing. It, it is actually our um, our top instructors. You all should start putting your knowledge on there. You should be making money. What are you doing here? <laughs> Go start making money on Udemy. <laughs> our, our top instructor has had gross core sales over ten million. Your top instructor over ten million. He sold over ten wow. million dollars. Wow. What what courses does he or she have? Uh, web development, iOS, mobile Got application, it. and he was, um, so he joined us a couple years ago, and he was, uh, I think he was a middle school teacher in the UK, and it just so turns out. He was a middle school teacher in the UK. Yeah, I think he was teaching math. Wow. It just so it turns out that he's a great teacher, and by that I mean he can break down concepts and communicate them in really effective manners. He's wow. a great teacher. Okay. So it's not and so did much he really he was do much promotion of his content, or did it just kind of go viral on your community? It went more viral than anything else. Wow! And it just so happened, like people took the course, they learned from it, and what a great know, story! Yeah. So in any case, the uh, going back to your, your top previous 10, question yeah. about top ten. So today it's still pretty early on in the market. I mean, if you kind of think about an, in aggregate, we haven't talked about the market in aggregate yet, but like, look, we've got 13 million students around the world. Mm -hmm. If you think about that in the context of how many people in the world could benefit from learning more and more practical skills throughout the rest of their lives, it's kind of like a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly well over a billion. Yeah. So we've barely scratched the surface. A lot of times uh, people don't actually realize that there are these incredible resources available online yet. Like mm -hmm. I think for, for folks in this room and folks who you know, work in technology, you're more comfortable searching online for these types of things. But most people don't actually realize, hey, I can actually learn mm -hmm. online in an affordable and accessible ma uh, manner. So it's still early days, and the reason I say that is, uh, as a result, it's still much more geared towards technology. So the folks that are thinking of, or realizing that uh, you need to constantly refresh and update your skills, um, those are the people that tend to find us, and for, for now, those are the more popular courses. And we also see that being replicated across different countries and different languages. So we see that- Outside, outside, of, hard, outside of web development, web design, Excel, what are, the, what are the really popular ones that do really well? Sure. Uh, so again, 70% is on the professional side. So yep. in professional is primarily programming, but then there's like IT, uh, and then there's more just strict professional and business. Mm -hmm. There's also certifications, third-party certifications like oh, wow. CCNA or uh, CompTIA. Or is langu like are languages big? Language is more, it's on the other side. It's yeah. um, not as big, uh, but it's, you know, the, I, I should mention that the personal enrichment side is growing pretty quickly. The, do not underestimate the, the diversity of all the different things that people want to learn. A lot of times, I'll give you an example. A lot of times people will say like, oh, it's Microsoft Excel. There's like basic and intermediate and advanced. Like, no, there's actually uh, Teach the Street, which is a boutique investment banking training house for invest, investment banking analysts. Yeah teaching merger modeling with Microsoft Excel. Got it. Right? It's not just negotiations, negotiating your salary, negotiating if you're China, in, in China, negotiating so on and so forth. Uh, and, the, and obviously in many, many different languages. So yeah. eventually our belief is that people are going to be teaching about skills that are highly localized to students in a particular area. And that matters because, you know, obviously you're going to learn better from somebody that's speaking the same language, has the same cultural yeah. cues, and teaching about skills that matter to you. And generally speaking, as you mentioned earlier, we find that people are more willing to pay for learning that directly correlates with their W-2. So if right. it, it has an ability to affect your income, of course I'll, I'll be more willing to pay for that. So I want to talk about some of your personal styles as a leader for SEC. Uh, how many of you right now are currently managing folks for your job or work? All right. So presumably one of the reasons, right, that someone like you is brought in is because you're going to be in a position to grow a team better, to build company culture, to scale the company. You have 250 folks right now. Um, talk about that process of scaling the company and, and describe your management philosophy overall. For the folks here that are aspiring to grow and build big companies, what are the lessons that they can take from you that sure. you've had on this journey? Sure. Uh, the biggest thing I would mention is as a, as a leader, uh, you have to think about how your role is going to be changing over time. And the faster you grow, the faster your role will change in what you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I'll, I'll give you an example. Like, okay, when I joined, we had a dozen people. Well, let me, I'm going to jump in. 
Talk to us for one second. What's your typical day to day? Like, oh, what are the things I focus on? Sure. Yeah, eight. You know, whatever. Eight to eight. What's your What's your work day? What do you do? Yeah. Well, well I should first mention. I, I I feel like I sit at the bottom of an inverted pyramid. <laughs> so my, my job, honestly, is to support the rest of the organization. Yep. Uh, so there isn't a, you know, as you can imagine, there isn't a typical day, but like the things that I most focus on are making sure that everyone understands what the strategic direction of the company is, so we're all marching in the, in the, in the same uh, direction. Uh, making sure that we have the right talent in the organization, so there's a lot on talent and recruiting. Um, the, the third one, I've, by the way, these aren't in any particular order, uh, there's one around um, making sure you have enough money, enough yeah. gas in the tank. Oftentimes you hear, for people that are uh, leading organizations, <clears throat> the, the joke is, what are the three things you have to do? Number one, mm -hmm. make sure you don't run out of money. Yeah. Number two, make sure you don't run out of money. <laughs> Number three, make sure you don't run out of money. And then the last thing is uh, heavy on communications, both externally as well as internally. And you find that as your organization gets bigger, the amount, the, the load on the internal communications goes up dramatically. So in any case, so going back to the, 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 your earlier question, what you do when you're 12, 15, 20 people versus 50 people versus 100 people versus 200 is totally different. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself like, oh, I'm doing the same stuff. Like, no, you, you cannot do that. There's no, there's no, in no world in, when you're at 250 people can you be doing the same things on a day to day. Like, oh, I'm going to take this hour and you draw a pie chart of the things that you're actually doing. There's no way you can do that. What's an example of something that 250 people that you can't do anymore that you did at 100? So in the beginning, um, I did a lot of the finance, right? Because I did had a finance background a, a long time ago. But like, if I'm sitting there like modeling out our budget or you know putting together an operating plan at a certain amount of scale, that means like, hey, we got a problem over there. Or uh, just more broadly speaking, if you're at this scale, if you're actually doing work in sort of a tactical sense, that means whoever owns that function, mm -hmm. there's probably something wrong. Right? Yeah. You should be thinking about how do I guide them, give them feedback and driving and making sure they're integrated into the rest of the organization. It's a weird concept. I remember 10 years ago, Mike Jones, who started Science, which Dollar Shave Club came out of, started and sold a bunch of companies. He told me, Jason, your job as CEO is not to do any work. <laughs> and I thought, man, you're crazy. You sold your first company. You've gone soft. You don't get it. And 10 years later, you really see the wisdom yeah. that if you're, as the CEO, responsible for any functional area, then, then you're the bottleneck. Yeah, that's right. right? That's right. Uh, so the, I'll give one, one other example. I think it was right around between 50 and 80 people. I realized that the internal comms piece, communications, was much more important because like, when you're 30, and you know, we've been doing all hands every two weeks for forever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, let's get together. We'll talk about like what's on your mind. And just hop into a conference room. When you're 80, there's like content programming. You have to think, oh, we're gonna have like an agenda. Mm -hmm. We're gonna cover specific things and make sure that people understand what's happening in the business and why. I mean, you you know, open Q and A and things like that. Yeah. But there's a there's a distinct shift in how you approach that. Yeah. So talk about at, a, at an organization 250 that you're leading. Um, what's, how do you keep the team aligned on the strategic priorities and, and how do you set up those internal communications? What are the specific things you do? Sure. Uh, so there are a lot of programs, there are a lot of tactics, um, but at the end of the day you have to make sure that your leaders are completely aligned and that's not as easy as it necessarily sounds. Like you, we spend a lot of time as a team with our executive staff and that is, I mean, the, the first, that concept right there is usually lost on people when, you know, as an example, you might say like, oh, I have a VP of X, and they'll, you'll ask them like, what do you do? Like, what team are you on? Like, oh, I'm on the engineering team, or I'm on the product team. Like, no, 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 you're on the executive staff. Like, that is your team, right? So the first- Do you actually know everybody's name in your company? Pretty close, but pretty I, close. I, I, I- Well, you have, you're hiring and you're letting folks go. Well, no, I, I, I practice. <laughs> you do? Yeah, yeah, no. I, I what do you actually, do to practice to memorize every 250 people's names? Uh, well, we have a, an online org chart now, but uh -huh. in the old days, I would just have somebody like print, it, print out everyone's picture, and I would just study it. Wow. Actually, people in my company don't know that, so now but not they do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that, maybe, I know, maybe I, I, you can put I, a course online about how to, <laughs> the best way it's, to... It's <laughs> really important. Like, do not underestimate that. That's really important. Yeah, I mean it's a big deal when you know you can say hi to somebody and 
know their background and who they are and their name. You'd be surprised at how many leaders don't. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about some other, talk about some other, what are the big pitfalls you made? What are, one of the things that I always try to ask the folks up here, um, you know, the idea of this forum is for us to be uncensored, is not only talk about the things we're having success in, but the things that we've really struggled with, right? Things sure. that are challenged, whether it's on the personal side or business side. I think too often, you know, folks that are starting their journey of entrepreneurship feel like everything has to be perfect. I always have to say things are going well. I can't talk about what's going poorly. But the point of a, a community like this is for us to share what is difficult and challenging. What have professionally been the hardest things for you the last two, three years, and what have personally been the hardest things for sure. you? Um, so the first thing I'd say is um, look at any scale of an organization, regardless of what it looks like from the outside, it's, it's tremendously difficult on the inside. Like I, you know, yes, we do have people that will come to us and say like, wow, you guys are doing great, you're mm -hmm. crushing it. And I'm kind of like, what are you, what are you talking about? Yeah. It's, it's like... It's a weird inside, feeling when you feel like inside things are, are messy, but from the outside everyone thinks it's great. You feel like a fraud. You feel like, oh, I'm just, <laughs> if they only knew. <laughs> well, it, the reality of it is, it's like, look, the inside is, it's like a sausage factory with blood, sweat, and tears. It yep. looks like every other company. So yep. I always chuckle when, you know, occasionally you go out there and you hear, you hear, like, you, you, I should say, you overhear somebody say, like, oh, we're crushing it. Mm -hmm. oh, you're not. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> crushing it. I mean, there are very few companies who do, right? Like, maybe Google or eBay in the early days yes. where literally half the, the entire company could probably go away and then, like, they come back in a couple weeks and, like, traffic would double or something like yeah. that. Like, that that's, but that never really happens. The reality of it is this stuff is so hard. So it's, uh, it's I don't, don't think at any given point, like when you see all these great companies that are out there, um, that it's not, it's like, it's super easy. It's never easy. And frankly, the class of problems that they're dealing with are much larger and much uglier. Like in the beginning, it's like, oh yeah, you, you think you have a problem? That's not a problem. Like nobody cares about it. But when you get bigger, like people actually care about you. Like the, the issues get magnified way bigger. And frankly, people will go after you much harder, much more aggressively, and they'll troll you when you're much bigger, mm -hmm. and when you're perceived as successful. When you're smaller, they don't care. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter. So um, I'll give you one particular lesson. One of the things I, I had this uh, ill-conceived notion early on around what it meant to, to build a team, okay? what it meant to build specifically an, an executive team. You think to yourself, like, oh, we're gonna build a team, I'm gonna hire these executives, like, we're gonna get scale, and then that's it. Like what you don't realize is like there that is a process that never ends. And the reason it never ends is because no particular individual is perfect for the entire sort of run across yep. the, the spectrum. Uh, the folks that we had when I first joined, it, like, and that's not true just for executives; it's true for any employee. Like the folks that we had when I first joined, under twelve people, like they were amazing for that stage. But mm -hmm. at like a hundred, like they were terrible. And vice versa, you dropped in the type of people that we were hiring at when we were 100 into that earlier stage. I mean, it, it's just, it doesn't work. So the difficulty is the faster you grow, the faster you have to cycle mm -hmm. through this. And you have to be really intellectually honest with yourself. It's oftentimes the case is you just leave people there way too long mm -hmm. and they're not happy, you're not happy, and you're just not successful. So this notion of like, yeah, I'm going to hire a team one time and that's going to be it, no such thing. You're always working through that process and it's super hard like hiring executives and making sure that they're integrated into the company and there isn't massive organ rejection is not an easy task and you do that across many many different functions it's it's an ongoing thing what what's personally been the hardest for you like it's a demanding job you've had a lot of pressure on you there's big spotlight on the company now yeah. what's personally been the most challenging over the last three four years well, look, uh, I mean, you guys, there's, there's so many people who are running and leading organizations. It's, there's, there's that saying that it's lonely at the top. And that is absolutely true. Um, there are so many decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that are completely gray, like 55, 45. Uh, and yeah, at some point, like, you get decision fatigue. Sure, but does anyone ever talk about that? No. Do you guys know, understand what, what I mean by decision fatigue? Mm -hmm. Have you seen that, uh, there was that New York Times article, I think recently, about Obama and how he, how he works? I don't know, did anyone read that? 
It was basically he talked about um, it was uh, him and Rahm Emanuel when they were going to retire. They're going to move over. They're going to move to Hawaii. Uh -huh. They're going to open up a little shop, and it's going to be a t-shirt shop. And they're going to sell one type of shirt, <laughs> size medium, white t-shirts. That's uh -huh. it because they're so tired of making really difficult decisions between sort of crappy outcome mm -hmm. A and terrible outcome B. Yeah. So it, the, the truth is a lot of leadership is just going through and making those tough decisions and you, you there's nowhere to go, like you have to make that call. Yeah. Let's talk about, I want to talk about your hiring process. I'm always curious to know what are the, what are the, what's like the one quality if you see in a current team member that you think to yourself like, no way, you're out, it's over? And what's the one quality that most attracts you to candidates that when you see you think this person has yeah. to be part of our organization? Yeah. Uh, so the first one is um, pretty easy. It's, it's um, we're a really humble culture. Uh, and it, you can spot arrogance and condescension from a mile away. Mm -hmm. And those people just, I mean, they literally just skip off. They don't, they don't make it very far. Uh, and then the second one is uh, we love to find people who love to learn. Oh, wow. So it, it probably comes as no surprise as being a learning company, but our general belief is like, hey, look, the world is moving to a place where things are changing faster and faster, and we're doing something that's never been done before. Like, there's no playbook. Mm -hmm. You have to find people who are willing to constantly reinvent themselves, and that's it. Um, so we, we actively seek people who align not only with our mission, but also have that drive to constantly be learning and constantly be trying to improve themselves. Mm -hmm. that's, all, I mean, that's, that's all you got. Like if you're an expert in one particular topic today, five years from now, like it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. There aren't that many topics that are truly evergreen. Yeah. Let's talk about, I mean, where do you go from here, right? At the, the platform, I think, is, is really well known. Do you, do you start going to traditional media and really pushing hard on radio and TV? Uh, do you expand the platform? Do you expand the, expand the content type? What, what are your b most big audacious goals for the next two years of the business? Sure. Um, so the easiest one is uh, going more global. So today, um, while about half of the revenue originates from outside the U.S., most of that revenue is still... Half of your revenue is outside the U.S.? Outside the U.S. Wow. And um, most of that is still students learning in English. Uh, and again, as we talked about, our belief is that People are going to learn, like we, we're really going to expand the market and open up the market when people are learning in their native tongue. And that really just hasn't happened yet from just more of an a, a awareness perspective. And if you think about it, uh, when we look at education on a sort of a, a, a macro or market basis, like the problems in education are so much greater outside the U.S. than inside the U.S. Inside the U.S., education is mostly an issue of affordability. Like, raise your hand if you have some sort of student debt. It's like, it's more than mm -hmm. credit card debt. It's more than auto loan debt. It's, it's a crazy amount. It's over $1.2 trillion. Mm -hmm. um, so we've made out education within the U.S. to be focused on affordability. But outside the U.S., it's much more around accessibility. It's more around the stories of our founder, where mm -hmm. literally, I don't have a school to go to. I don't have the right teacher or an instructor. I don't have the right content. And what Unity does is we bridge time and space to bring the right instructor and the right content to them. Uh, and I'll give you a, one other example. Look, if you open up in the US, you open up the Wall Street Journal, and you kind of flip through the first couple of pages, what kind of ads do you see? IBM, business services. It's mostly like luxury goods, right? Yeah. But if you go outside the US, and you, open, and you flip through major media, most of the ads you see around education, vocational training, because education is that pathway to economic opportunity. And for people who are even further away, education is, an, is sort of a means to ending intergenerational poverty. So what you find is that people are willing to pay so much more of their, a percentage of their income on education because of how important it is to them relative to more developed countries like where we are. So we really see the opportunity outside the US. And I wouldn't be, wouldn't be surprised if 80% of our business is outside the US and not, not a, uh, in a short period of time. Got it. Um, what's the experience been like for you running a company that was non-founder of and were there times that it's been hard or especially early on as you were making that transition? Uh, there are a lot of times that, you know, I think in my experience I've seen it 50-50, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes you bring in the outside CEO and it's someone talented and capable like you that has a good rapport with the founders and takes it to the next level and sometimes it messes up the chemistry and the DNA of what it made it work. What 
what put you into that first category and what was that journey like for you? Yeah. So I actually would give it a less than 50% chance of success, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, I don't want to make it sound bad <laughs> when you sitting yeah. here. I mean, I consider myself in some ways a refounder. Uh, and that is like, okay, I wasn't part of the founding team, but you have to have that. You were there at, at, at 12. That's pretty early on. You, and you have to have a, found, a founder mentality, yeah. right? And uh, I think it worked for us because we had, you know, first of all, we were completely aligned in terms of how uh, our beliefs around the company culture but, and what we were trying to accomplish, but also, importantly, roles and responsibilities. Um, it was, there was no sort of, like, I never got into his stuff, and he never got into the stuff that I was working on, and we had complete trust that um, uh, we were each doing the right thing, and it's not to say that we weren't challenging each other, but that was really, really important. Uh, but, you know, eventually when it came time to, I think we, we made the formal transition we raised our Series C in the beginning of 2014, and at that particular point, the company had gotten to a particular scale and size where, you know, it, I was effectively running the business anyway. And you know, we, when we made the transition, we were fortunate enough to have nobody left, and we had great retention, and the business kept on growing. So, uh, as far as transitions go, this was as smooth as smooth as they get, but it, it's never easy. You know, I think that we all, um, everyone here, is because we're trying to aspire to do something big on the business side. And seeing the growth story of a company like Udemy five years in is amazing. I think when you layer on top of that the mission of the company, help, how it can help, is helping and will continue to help so many people, it's really incredible. Um, you know, I've known the company for a long time, but you and I didn't get to know each other that much. And I gotta tell you, brother, I'm blown away. The company is Appreciate clearly that. successful because you're at the helm, and we're all very lucky to have you. Thank you so much for coming down here. Thank you. And sharing your time with us today. Thank you.